thank you all so much for coming, um, and Ellie for asking me and having this wonderful salon. I think it's great that she's doing this, and I think she's doing a really good job. So I'm really excited about being here today and seeing not only familiar faces that I see a lot, but also some new faces. And um, again, I'm Kristen Miller Hopkins. Um, I'm a local artist here, and I also am an associate professor at Palm Beach State College. Um, at the Lake Worth campus, and I teach um, art and design. Over the years, I've also run the gallery there, so I'm, I've kind of been around the area for a while. Um, and as Ellie mentioned, in making this kind of presentation, I think as artists, we're really hard on ourselves, <laughs> or at least I know I am. Anyone, you guys can relate to that, right? And I told Ellie that, you know, I always think, I, I don't make enough work. I need to make more. I need to make more. And in making this presentation, I thought, oh my gosh, I have to edit, I have to take things out, I have so much work to talk about, so hopefully I won't talk about too much work. <laughs> um, basically, I just wanted to talk briefly about the beginning of you know, myself making some artwork and some general themes that you'll see throughout um, my process as an artist. Um, I went to Florida State University for my bachelor's degree. And I actually started out in the interior design program because I thought, I love fabric, I love homes, I love color, this seems like the perfect logical thing. And I was very concerned, I was kind of unusual, I was concerned about getting a job. So I thought, oh, art degree, you can't get jobs with art degrees. But I w started the program and I realized that it just wasn't for me, so I switched to the studio program and I loved it. And I really focused on photography and printmaking in my bachelor's degree. Um, but I quickly learned that I didn't like either of them as straight photography, you know, straight photography or straight printmaking. I always found myself to be the odd person in the photo department and the odd person in the printmaking department in terms of I wanted to make photographs on wood or fabric and I wanted to sew on them or I wanted to print um, you know, photographs and then silkscreen on top of them. And I was always kind of the odd man out. So I was kind of searching for some, you know, your, your identity as an artist, which we all have done. So some themes that I kind of go over and over and over. Um, I'm definitely, I focus a lot on identity in terms of where I am as a woman in the world and place in my life. Um, I think about place a lot, and place to me can mean geographic place, so I do a lot of work involving mapping, even if it's abstract mapping. Um, but this place could also be a life role, you know, a student, um, young, right now I'm a young mother, so I'm making work about that. Um, for several years ago I was newly married, so I made some work about that. Um, so trying to think of where I am in terms of stages as a woman. I do a lot of work that involves ritual and habit meaning um, I like to set up systems. So for instance, whether it's I do a drawing a day or I take a photograph a week or every Friday afternoon I do this. That helps me. It kind of creates this um, ritual that I find calming. And it's good because then at the end of however many, whatever the designation of time is, whether it's a month, a year, then you have all this work which is nice. So ritual you'll see um, and habit um, is definitely part of my artwork. I recently read this book called The Power of Habit. If anyone's interested in um, how habits are developed, it's actually a really amazing, it's on the New York uh, bestseller list right now. It's really good. Um, so I thought I would just mention it for a moment. Um, not only habit, but also habitats. And that can involve um, natural habitats or, as, or also the home as a habitat. I had to make a lot of work about the home. I know these are, this is a lot of themes. So you can see that I, I, don't, I kind of go through these different phases where I focus on something and then I change, just like everybody else. Some people are a little bit more focused. I like to kind of experiment with a lot of different things. I use text um, and I think about and make work about patterns, whether it's pattern design or whether it's family patterns, um, things that we continue to do or things that we continue to see in our families, um, whether it involves addiction or um, collection, things like that. And then in terms of mediums, I, again, I use a lot of different mediums, hence the reason why at Florida State I couldn't find my right spot. Um, so I, I make things involving handmade paper, printmaking, bookmaking, photography, and I do a lot of site-specific installation. I also do drawing, but it's very um, kind of abstract sense of drawing. 
And using space is very important to me. So this first piece is just a very old piece. It's probably you know, one of my first pieces out of college. And it's handmade paper. Then there's photographs that are printed on the handmade paper. And then they're kind of strung um, on this piece of bamboo. And so I was thinking about how to make a flat photograph feel a little bit sculptural and also give it texture. You'll see that I'm very interested in texture. Hence, the handmade paper to me is like this perfect um, medium and substrate upon which to give something a little bit more life. To me, texture brings life to things. So that was a brief Florida State University slide. Um, after my time in Tallahassee, I moved to upstate New York, um, Rochester specifically, to go to graduate school where I went to a small school called Visual Studies Workshop. Now, no one's ever heard of this school. It's super small, meaning 30 people in like the whole school. <laughs> it's very alternative, which is exactly what I wanted. Um, Florida State is huge, 30,000 people. And um, Visual Studies Workshop was literally 25 to 30 people at a given time, and like four or five professors. Super small, very specialized, focuses on, um, most people go there for photography or bookmaking only. There's not really anything else. But of course, being a Florida girl, I'm actually from Palm Beach County, moving to Rochester, New York was a bit of a shell shock for me. Um, I didn't know what I was getting myself into at all. And so I started making work about my move. So I made this piece on the, um, on the left called Migratory Patterns. And it was a one-of-a-kind book. It was probably one of my first books that I made where um, basically it was collages and drawings and photographs. All This is just one spread. Um, you know, it's a book of like 20 different pages. And the book was about my move, north versus south, basically. So this particular page, um, so, you know, sea life versus things that are furry and woolly. Um, I'm a big nature person. I love taking hikes and walks, and I go to the ocean. So this was a big switch for me to see chipmunks instead of jellyfish. Um, so basically, that book was about my migration, which sounds a little um, you know, uh, dramatic, but it did feel like a dramatic change of place, of space, of habitat. And I was really interested in you know, exploring that new habitat. And this piece on the right here was called Moved Spaces. Again, my move was really wonderful and traumatic for me at the same time. Um, so these three pieces at the bottom, um, they were tunnel books. Has anyone ever seen a tunnel book before? It's where you look in and there's these different um, slats and they're, um, each image makes up one total image. So they're three dimensional. And so the, the books were in the shape of a house. And at this point, I'd moved. I'd had a lot of different apartments. So what I did was I basically made this imagined space, imagined space, this fictional space, of all of my bedrooms into one bedroom, all of my kitchens into one kitchen. So each of the, so there's, um, I believe this was the, this was the bedroom, this was the kitchen, and this was the living room. And so it was basically thinking about memories and our home as a memory. You know, all of us have certain memories of you know, standing at the kitchen counter, or looking outside, or being in your bedroom. And if you've moved around a lot, those memories kind of you know, truncate into one, and you kind of forget, was that in this apartment or this apartment? So I made these tunnel books to kind of you know, just remember that um, translation of spaces. And the image on the back, which really looks like a huge drawing, because that's what it is. This is my first attempt at um, exploring wallpaper, which you'll see again. I actually revisit this exact wallpaper piece at um, a 10 by 10 installation only a couple of years ago. So you'll see that I actually kind of recycle my own work. I know a lot of artists do that. Yeah. <laughs> How can I make this fresh and new? But do the same thing. <laughs> so this, um, it was basically drawings that were Xeroxed and on one of those large architectural printers, the blueprint printers. And it was my first kind of large attempt at large scale. This is about 10 feet by 10 feet um, flat. And I know you can't see the actual line work, but you'll see it in that next slide and you'll have to remember it. So there'll be a quiz. 
So um, again, we're still in, I'm, I'm kind of exploring my graduate work. And I'm, again, I'm at this place where it's basically photography and bookmaking only. So I'm really learning the fine craft of making books, binding, sewing, the, you know, the conservation of them, all of that. And I, I'm a big um, thrift store person. I like to go and shop and find little treasures, as many of us do. And I stumbled upon this book called The Perfect Woman. And it was written in 1893. And I was obsessed. <laughs> I thought this was the best thing I've ever found. Um, it was divided into chapters on how to be this so-called perfect woman. Oh my god, you, you got to be kidding me. You, 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 I am not you kidding. Didn't, you didn't find it. It no. found me, that's right. So I thought, this is fantastic. I have to make something about this. Because of course, I was a young woman, you know, trying to kind of explore who I wanted to be. I think we all continue to do that. No one ever stops doing that. Um, and I, what I thought was really curious, it was inspirational as well as very depressing <laughs> at the same time, was that these kind of rules to be a perfect woman were very similar than they are today. 1893, today, I thought, man, maybe we should have like moved a little forward by now. So I made this book called The Perfect Woman, and I actually brought a copy if anyone wants to look at it. Um, this, again, this is in 2004. I was exploring alternative photographic processes. So if anyone's familiar with cyanotype, which is the blue print, probably have seen that before, and um, Van Dyke brown, which is actually this kind of brownish color. So um, it's all hand-bound, sewn on, and it basically explores the different stages of the perfect woman. And there's five different stages. Um, so this is one spread. And again, there's sewing and drawing. And they go through the different stages. So the different stages were ingenue, mother, lover, caretaker, and preserver. So think about those stages. Do they apply today? Yes. So you know, basically what I did was I made a cyanotype print of, you know, the book was set very thick. And I selected basically five or six pages to reproduce so that we could read you know, this kind of interesting text. And then I um, embroidered all the different stages on the side. So it's a lot of work. And I also made five of these. <laughs> They're exactly the same. Um, I, I'm very interested in kind of detail over detail, probably painstakingly ridiculous detail sometimes. Um, but I was really pleased with this book, not only in terms of the, you know, my continuation of exploring not only feminine craft, but of thinking about what it means to be a woman um, in today's society, but also historically. I think that was really interesting to me. After I did this um, edition of five, I got the opportunity to um, create an installation in an old window uh, display in downtown Rochester, you know, the old um, department stores, things like that. So, and again, in terms of changing your work for the space, which is something that I'm very interested in, I thought, well, I, I'm not finished with this book yet. It's so rich. It's really interesting to me. I was, you know, I was printing things like crazy. But basically, um, I did a window installation where all of the background is, the it's the same work, but just a different form. So these, this is the, the brown is the um, Van Dyke brown print. And it's kind of a drawing of a, a young woman. And then it's almost like a timeline. This is all embroidered on um, cloth. And then the cyanotype, the blue, is printed on cloth and then sewn around as well. So it goes through the same stages, ingenue, lover, mother, caretaker, and preserver, kind of as a pyramid, almost, of the ups and downs of life. <laughs> um, and I was really thinking about how to change. I love the intimacy of the book. If you think about a book, really only one person can look at it at one time, you know, practically. And I think that's really special. I think there's something really quiet about that. But how do you, it's not that accessible <laughs> in terms of display and things like that. So um, I like the accessibility of an installation and I like this kind of duality um, in terms of making both. So after I did that installation, I kind of got this installation bug in me. And um, I just have a, this, this is my last project in graduate school. This was actually my thesis project. And it was called Inhabitable. And I worked on this for um, a, a year. It was a whammy. Um, and the basic idea was that I created a system. I got a space. It was about the size of this room. And I drew and silkscreened and 
made things on the wall every day for four hours. So as you can imagine, the wall kind of came to life. Um, and I'm just going to read this little thing at the bottom here. Home is not only my habitat, but a documentation of my habits. A morphology of markings and sharpings inhabitable creates a sense of wall life as opposed to wallpaper, which is very static. So the, I wanted the walls to feel like they were moving, like they were breathing. They were, um, you know, a documentation of what I was doing in there. Um, and this was, I don't know why, I love, this is like the first drawing I did of um, this idea. So the idea was to create, again, this duality. And again, I, I see that a lot in my own work, that I'm doing two things at once. So I was not only, it's a play on words, inhabit, right, in terms of every day or whatever that marking of time is, but also habitat and inhabiting a space. So the habitats that I explored were all um, very influenced by my childhood here in South Florida. Um, I explored the sea which is below, and then I explored the land, and then I went up to the sky. So when you walked in the room, and I have up here a nice quote from, anyone ever read Gaston Bachelard, Poetics of Space? It's a lovely, lovely book. I would definitely recommend it. Um, and I like this quote, every corner in a house, every angle in a room, every inch in secluded place in which we like to hide or withdraw in ourselves is a symbol of solitude for the imagination. That is to say, it is the germ of the room or a house. So he has this whole chapter on corners and how corners are these lovely little parcels of space. And to me, the corner of a room is kind of like the gutter of the book. To me, I know that's kind of like a stretch, but um, you know you can you, you can get into it. You can envelop. It can envelop you into a corner, as opposed to standing in the middle of the room, you feel much more vulnerable, right? So this installation was only in the corners of the rooms. You walked in corner, so it's um, drawings and and silk screen on the wall, and then one here and one here. So this was the first one, the C. And I called it the sea that held the sheets. Um, and it, the jellyfish are silk screened, and then there's drawings, and there's also sculpture. But you can kind of get the sense of this, this is a 16 foot ceiling. So they extend um, horizontally, it's eight feet, and then it goes up 16 feet. So it was quite an endeavor. Um, a bed floats, and I had to do a lot of writing about it, so a bed floats under the metallic and lacing tentacles of the jellyfish of my youth. And as you moved around the room, this was stories that stained the sofa. This was the one that people really kind of tended to really love for some reason. The ants were a big hit. I love these little guys. Um, I've used them several times in the past. Um, they're silk screened on the walls. And then all these kind of darker areas, like here, 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 and here, and again up there, um, they're fabric that's applied directly to the wall. So everything is done directly onto the wall, which was really amazing. Um, that I found a landlord that would let me do this <laughs> to his room. And, um, and it was really kind of wonderful for me, too. And, and the biggest project I've ever done, even to this day, this was you know, quite a big undertaking. Um, this was the, um, the, the sky, the dinner amongst wind ballets. And in the kitchen, there were always the birds swooping through soup and leaving traces of peanut butter in their wings. So again, the bird, there's it's the same materials, fabric, silk screen, drawing, um, all directly onto the wall. So the, the wonderful thing about this was that I got to have this safe space where I inhabit, inhabited, and I worked on every day for a long time. The downfall of installation is not only is it very labor intensive, as some of you know, but sometimes you know, you don't take it with you. I'm not bringing this room around with me. <laughs> so um, I decided that, let me go back so you can see. Does everyone see all these like little things on the floor? I decided that I needed like a takeaway element. Um, and I was, for some reason, I came up with this idea of artist trading cards, like baseball cards. Um, and I decided that I would photograph sections of, each of the wall. And then I would make a box set where people could buy the whole box or one at a time. So that there was not only documentation of the wall, and you can get a better sense of the imagery here. So they're not only documentation for me, but also um, as something you know that people could take with them or purchase or whatever that is. So again, you see the work. 
in a different way. I mean, this is so small and this was so large. So I tend to work either tiny, tiny, tiny or maximal. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> um, but again, I brought this if anyone wants to look at this. I, and again, I can't make more than just one of these. So I made 25 box sets and there's 25 cards on each set. So it's, you know, it's just a small project. <laughs> And these are some these are some details of those um, cards. Uh, the one on the top is they're actually both from that story that stained the sofa, the land. Um, and you can see that the the bottom is um, fabric that's kind of collaged and then applied directly to the wall. And then there's drawing like basically right around that um, that fabric. And then of course the playful. I'm deathly allergic to fire ants, and I've had some kind of run-ins with them over the years, and so. I'm intrigued by them, and I'm also terrified of them. So it was really, uh, I guess, important for me to do a piece involving these red little fire ants. Um, after graduate school, and I kind of moved around a little bit, um, I at some point moved back here, and um, you know, kind of started my new chapter here. Um, and I met my husband, which was wonderful. And I started thinking about identity as a wife, as a artist, things like this, these new roles, basically. So I made this book called Homestellations. I like to combine words. He's very interested in stars, and he looks at his telescope all the time, and I don't know anything about the stars, nothing. Never thought about them before, actually. And um, so I made this um, one-of-a-kind book that's basically um, drawings of homes, fictional homes, almost in like a blueprint kind of manner. And they're on graph paper that's a little translucent. And then you can see the digital photographs of these kind of abstract floors. I was working in a gallery. And I what I loved most about the gallery was the floor. I don't know what that says about me. But I photographed the floor. I was there a lot, many hours. So I photographed the floor. And it was really abstract and cracked and textured and lovely. And so I thought that I liked the, the duality of these two things, these kind of mechanical drawings on top and layered on top of the um, textured photographs. And there's a little bit of text in the front of the book. You can kind of see it on that image on the left. And this is just one little snippet, um, an excerpt. The stars guide them. These drawings and photographic patterns represent the beginning blueprints and mappings of a marriage. Separate pages retain their translucency, yet becoming unique and opaque shades of blue. His star patterns and her wall patterns delicately overlapping. Occasional hiccups present structural and optical illusions, but the floor is strong and the sky is open. Homestellations is an artist book of bound drawings and digital photographs on a wood base. I'm very interested in writing. You probably kind of picked that up. So um, I tend to use text a lot in my work in some version. In 2009, I got the opportunity to be involved in Showtel, which I'm sure many of you have been to Showtel. Of course, we miss having Showtel as an art venue. And I did this collaboration. I actually don't do a lot of collaborations. Um, I have one artist friend that I've collaborated with over the years exclusively. Um, but as a whole, I'm kind of a, I'm a, lone, a lone artist, usually. But I did um, do this collaboration with um, the artist Adrian Turk. She actually teaches with me at the college. And um, we started talking about our own work and our interested, interests in habitats, creating habitats. We both are very interested in um, kind of the tactile and texture. Um, and we started talking about habits and personal consumption, eating specifically. So this piece was called Munching, Crunching, Bunching, Scrunching. And it was really, it was really layered. Again, layering is something that I'm very interested in. I can't just do one thing. Um, so she had, and, and it's hard to kind of tell where her imagery ends and where mine begins. And that's actually part of collaboration. That's part of the hard part about collaboration. I actually think this is probably my least successful installation. What's interesting about this is that I say this is the messiest thing I've ever done, and she says that it was her most tidy thing that she's ever done. <laughs> so that says we actually kind of had a hard time because she's real, you know, kind of messy, and I, you know, kind of want things lined up. Um, so there's silk screen. Those little ants made an appearance. Um, it's 
again, that kind of recycling my old work. Um, and she had these mixed media sculptures, these kind of dark, um, they were wax and thread and twine. We had a slide projection. And the thing that changed the space the most, and that's what installation is about, it's about changing space, was that we had this audio component that was this like chewing, munching, crunching, and it was really loud when you went in there. Um, and that, to me, kind of brought everything together. But again, I don't know that I was super happy with this piece. But it's good to show the pieces that aren't so perfect as well, right? Um, again, we're kind of getting to the um, most recent years. And I got married. I said that before. <laughs> um, but I wasn't finished dealing with this kind of change of role and identity. And I go between making quick mixed media collages and installations. And there's a reason for that. Installations are extremely labor intensive. And they take a lot of time and energy. And sometimes you just want to make something small that's fast. <laughs> so you can kind of see this kind of um, switching back and forth. Um, so I made, uh, I, I usually work in series. I made, a, I made 12 of these. And at the time, I had this show in Chicago. Anyone ever been to the ARC gallery in Chicago? You have? It's been there a long time. It's one of the longest run um, cooperative galleries in Chicago since the 70s. And uh, I had this show there with this friend that I collaborate with a lot. Um, and it was, the show was called Homepage. So it was all about um, the home and how our interpretation of the home. So these are just two of the 12. Um, but again, this kind of layering, working with fabric, um, small sculpture. These are this kind of like cotton balls that are twisted and twined. and and. It's meant to be abstract. It's not meant to be, you know, this is what I think about marriage <laughs> right here. It's meant to be just kind of me exploring space and materials. Um, and, you know, when you, when you do that throughout 12 or 20 or whatever the number is, you do kind of find these similarities of um, mark making. Um, this was a piece I did for the 10 by 10 uh, series, and I was really happy with this piece. This is the piece that I mentioned. The wallpaper was from way back with those tunnel books. So I revisited it. Um, basically, I re this, is, this is what it looks like up close on the left. It's really fine pen work um, that I then scanned. I did on paper, scanned into the computer, um, printed on large printer on canvas, and then made these kind of wallpaper panels. Um, and if anyone wants any, I have so much of this at home. <laughs> so um, this piece was called Nesting. And um, again, kind of exploring. I'm interested in patterns in terms of not only the act of making them, of doing the same thing over and over, but also the history of patterns. I'm very interested in like William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. Um, and then also um, texts like the yellow wallpaper that you know is the classic story of this repetition can be something that's warrant, you know, beneficial for you that keeps you stable, but it can also make you crazy. <laughs> and I think that kind of fine line is a fine line that I think a lot of artists try to negotiate. Can you guys relate to that? Um, you know, some people think doing installations is crazy. This show is up for one night. One night, you know? Um, so the, the, the work in the middle, the sculptural work, is um, a nest, literally. And there are paper cast eggs and twine and small sculptural materials. There's a lot of wax. Um, and again, I was thinking of this yellow wallpaper. This is kind of my version of the story, um, creating this space to rest and thinking about, back to the perfect woman, that idea of nesting, of creating a home, a place that is sacred and safe for you or you and your partner or you and whoever is there. Anyone familiar with the curator, Lisa Rockford? She does a lot of shows down in Fort Lauderdale. And she has great shows. Um, I did this piece for um, her down in the 1310 Gallery in Fort Lauderdale. And it was called Gender Gentle Reminders. And Ellie and I were talking about this earlier, about how when people say feminism or feminine issues, that can, bring, it can be loaded, right? Some people can get all hot and bothered. And 
I wanted to kind of talk about that without it being in your face. Um, I'm not a confrontational person. I'm not aggressive by nature. But I do have ideas that maybe I should be a little bit more aggressive about. So I made this piece called Gender Gentle Reminders. And it goes, it's, it's again, that going back and forth. It goes back and forth. This is all embroidered text on cloth that's then in embroidery hoops. And it goes around, um, I was thinking about the kind of classic quilting bee or the circle where women historically would sit around and pass around embroideries and chat about life. So it kind of goes around alternating between gender reminders and gentle reminders. So at, um, at the top, I'm just, it says be calm right here. Oh, and the, the, the ones that are in, these were in blue and then these were in pink. Again, thinking about gender. And the one in the center was basically where this, um, where this piece was inspired by. There was an article in the New York Times. And it says, women today do almost as well as men, dot, 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 if they don't have children. So that's where this began. Um, and there's a lot of articles about this. I just read one today. Um, so it began, that was in the middle. And it kind of alters between the, the gentle reminder, be calm, focus, breathe love every day, and patience. I think those are things that I need to remind myself. A lot of people need to remind themselves of doing these things. So those are the gentle reminders, the things that I hear my mom saying to me in my head, relax, be patient. And then the more loaded gender reminders um, were alternating. So they're either things that have been said to me or things that my friends have said, can you believe some this? person said this. Um, this is a good one. Hey, boss, please don't call me kiddo. Um, I like the summertime because women wear less clothing. Uh, when your husband cleans, do you thank him? <laughs> Love that one. It's funny that we, I do that. Oh, thank you so much. Who thanks me? <laughs> um, do you know how to use power tools? That was a good one, too. Um, you drive a stick shift. You must be an aggressive woman. It's actually been said to me before several times. I don't know how driving a stick shift makes you aggressive. Um, and then they're, 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 you can see there's string. And these are like hand weights. So they're kind of um, the foundation is they're, they're being dragged down a little bit. So in interest of words, I took on this huge project. And I kind of changed gears. And this is just in the, I've worked on this piece for the last three years on and off. Um, it's called Cutting Words. I know uh, many of you have seen this in various forms. Um, basically, I set up a system. I, I teach. I teach a lot of classes. I don't have a lot of time. And so I wanted to do something that I could feel like I was making something, but didn't feel so like this huge project that I couldn't wrap my head around. So what did I take on? Cutting words. That's not labor intensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and also do something that was physically and material-wise accessible, but also calming for me. And I know it sounds odd to say that cutting 300 feet of words is, was calming to me, but it was. Um, so I'm going to, these are some of the words, and then I'm going to talk about it. Um, again, the, and this is just a shot of in my studio, and I have some um, uh, installation shots. When we bind, I feel woven, those cutting words. Those words slice and mark my body with notches to tear out for later. The score has not been settled. It has diced objects into small tendrils of sound. You rip, I notch, and marry us back together with puckered and pressed tomorrows. Join, interweave, braid, entwine, graft, interlace, knit, marry, tie, weave, wed, unite, plate, divide, striate, chip. We cut out a home for more. Those words slice into and join us together. Sever, groove, nick, splice, score, scallop, dent, pierce, section, fragment, shear, scale, distort, reflect, notch. We wove thickly bound words to find precision within the chaos, snip, section, truncate, laceration, split, chop, bulge, ribbed, striate, fillet. Let's nix defensive and cunning language until its layers are scratched below the surface. So you can see that the language has two different voices, basically. These literal cutting words. You know, literally, I went to the thesaurus. <laughs> and I thought of every cutting word I could think of. And then there's this other voice that's kind of between two people. And it's really about communication. It's really what it's about. Um, 
I know a lot of people, and, and I myself sometimes, you know, I can get defensive or I, it's hard to take criticism sometimes and really kind of reflect on what people are really saying. So it, this is what this piece was trying to kind of decipher for me um, and to get, to get away from the cutting words and let's, let's talk, you know, really um, productively instead of using these words that slice or hurt. This was the first installation of it, and 10 by 10, um, the 10 by 10, uh, 2010, after the, I did nesting first and then this one. And basically these cutting words were these sections of paper, and then I made this huge ball lit from the inside, and there was imagery of um, scissors at the top. And it was kind of this ball of words that was like exploding out, um, and sometimes, language can be that way, you know, or a conversation can be explosive. But then it was also delicately layered and the words, you couldn't read all of them, they were obscured, which, you know, if, um, I think sometimes happens in a conversation as well, you kind of highlight, your, your mind gra grabs onto one thing and forgets the rest, right? And because this ball was sculptural, again, you didn't see all of the words. So this is the first um, inclination of this. This was the second installation of um, this cutting word piece. Um, I work a lot with, um, any, everyone familiar with white space collection? If you aren't, it's a fantastic space. Um, I actually have worked there over the years and I've done a lot of graphic work for her. Um, and we started talking about this piece and she asked me if I would do a, um, an intervention in her space, which is basically like an installation but specific for her space. So I was really excited and I said, sure, I have all these words. What else am I doing with them? Um, so, but I wanted to do something different than the ball. I was done with the ball of words. This was a different space. It's 3,000 square feet, her collection. And my cutting words basically were installed at the top of the, um, of, you know, almost in the ceiling. And they were dangling and they became kind of lacy, which I really liked. Because they didn't feel super lacy in the 10 by 10 version. So I was actually a lot happier with this, um, this installation. And you can see they're right here. I'm sorry, th these arrows, it's like the only way to show which one is my work, not this big guy. <laughs> Um, th so they, they kind of like danced and hovered and dangled all over the space. Thank goodness for, um, does anyone know Yasek? He installed these. He literally hung from the rafters for me <laughs> to do this. <laughs> Poor guy. So when you walked in, this says cutting words. And the problem, again, installation is tricky to photograph and document. That's, there's no way around that. The other problem is that I'm doing white on white. So the, you know, there's no way around that either. So here they are here, and they're over here. They're up here around the pipe. They're dangling. And what I really liked about this was the way the light caught the different words and how watching people like go around reading. It's always funny to watch people look at artwork, I think. So I was pretty happy with this, actually. This piece called Anti-Slides was a little different from probably a lot of my other work, um, except for that it's still layering, it's still investigating habitats, and it's still working with mark making. Um, I found someone had given me actually a huge box of old slides. And I really love slides. I love the way they look. I love the backlit. I love the smell and the sound of the slide projector. There's something nostalgic about it for me. Um, and I was trying to think of how could I make these images, and I didn't know what they, some of them I didn't know what they were. I think some of them were people's travel photos, some were art history paintings, there was a ton of them. Um, so I decided, you know, and a slide is what, this big, right, two by two? I decided I would paint on them, scratch them, uh, sew on them, punch them out, so that I was building this new story, this new habitat. Um, and these are just two, there were 60 of these. And they became like these miniature little paintings. And I really was into them. Um, and I've exhibited them in several different forms. One in projected slides, again at that same ARC gallery show that I had in 2009. And then in video form, um, because the slide projector can be kind of clunky and bulbs go out and you can't buy them anymore. <laughs> so um, I decided I should scan them and make them into a short video, which I had in the Outside the Box show 
uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, and again, these are just two um, out of the 60, but I was, I was kind of into them, but they were, in terms of imagery, a little darker. My palette is usually kind of the natural tones, um, pastels even, and these were a little darker, which a lot of people were surprised about. But I was excited to do something different. Sometimes you need to get out of your own comfort zone. So after I did the slides, I, um, I was thinking again about that kind of technology of, is this, it, our slide is obsolete. <laughs> and I got the iPhone, <laughs> this is 2012, like everybody else in the world. And you know, it's kind of, this, is, this piece is called eye invasion because sometimes it feels that way, um, that you know, Apple is invading our lives. Um, and these are a series of four. So these photographs, are all taken on the iPhone, which I think is awesome and easy and quick, which is why we love technology. But of course, I can't just do that. That's not enough for me. Wonderful for other people, not for me. So I made, um, again, these are just two out of the four. I made these kind of um, weird habitats kind of growing out of these um, slick photographs. So this is, again, that cyanotype, that blue uh, alternative process print. And then there's drawing and painting. Uh, there's even like a real wing here from a butterfly. This is linotype, and there's some found collage. This is a little sculptural with um, fabric. And there's even a little bit of my wallpaper in there as well. And these were at that 1310 gallery and then Art Palm Beach last year. So we're getting to my current work and just the last year. Um, this was my show called Family Trees, which I know Ellie saw, I think. Um, and Jackie was there as well, as well as Elise and Christina. Um, this was at the a solo show at the Palm Beach Cultural Council. They have a lovely little space. I know you had a show there as well. And I showed a series of nine 18 by 24 mixed media pieces. Um, all basically stemming from, um, I had a baby in August, and um, he's wonderful. And I started thinking about, I made all of these kind of in preparation for him. Um, he was born in August, and I made all of these basically between about, let's say, April and July. And towards the end of the summer, you know, I'm uncomfortable, it's hot. <laughs> and I um, wasn't teaching this summer. I took summer B off to prepare. And I was doing a lot of walking and thinking about how my life is going to change, all of those things. And you don't really know how it's going to change, but you're anxious and thinking about it. Um, and one thing that I did with this series that is kind of new for me is that I used watercolor, which I've never used watercolor in my life. Um, and something interesting about the watercolor that happened was so all I wanted to do was be submerged in water. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what the symbolism of that is, but I went to the beach every day. I went you know, in the bathtub every day. I was just, maybe I was hot. I don't know what it was. But I just wanted to be submerged. Maybe my son will be an Olympic swimmer. I don't know. So I, start, I thought, well, what can I do with this? What does this mean? I don't know what it means. But I decided I'm going to break out these watercolors that I've had and never used. And so. I didn't want to use them in the traditional watercolor way. I just wanted these washes of color, which is exactly what I did here with the pink and then the, um, the kind of yellowy. So these are called family trees, um, again, because I was thinking about genealogy, traits that we pass down. Um, and they're very layered. Um, I, there's some, in terms of mediums, this is handmade paper, all of this. Um, this is ink on vellum and then sewn onto the paper. These are different pieces of fabric, and then watercolor, and this is a little cyanotype as well. So you can see similar themes in terms of materials. I use the same materials over and over. Um, and again, this is, um, these are all 18 by 24. And I needed to do something that was also, I didn't want to do an installation. I was wanting to work on these kind of quickly, and I was, walking around on the beach, walking around on, you know, hiking and kind of looking at different plants and different root systems. And I was thinking that the family is like a root system. And my grandparents actually have this huge family tree in their hallway. You know, the traditional hallway with all the photographs of the family, right? There's like these old, you know, like 1800 photographs of great grandfather, whoever. And there's this huge family tree. And 
as I, when I was younger, I was always obsessed with it, looking at all the names, and it was very detailed and drawn out perfectly. And for some reason, I was thinking about that family tree and how my family tree was going to be expanding and you know, thinking about names, too, things like that. So I was looking at all these different natural um, root systems and different, these are all kind of different um, algae or plants, um, flowers, things like that, and seeing how they correspond it. It's an abstract um, exploration of the idea of family, but I was pretty happy with it. Um, and I also you know, used similar, you know, this is a um, lino cut, different papers, watercolor. The watercolor was really new for me, and I was really surprised that I liked it. I'm thinking of continuing to do it a little bit. This is the last series I have. This is the most recent, um, and I know some of you have seen it as well. It's called The Weight of Paper. There's four of these. These are large scale, they're 60 by 60 photographs, not drawn on, not sewn on, completely pure photography. Really strange. Um, and they were in Art Palm Beach this last year, but they, they basically stem from, this is one of them. I only have two of them, I didn't bring all four. They're, they're actually medium format um, images of paperweights. My Nana, a lot of people think they're marbles, but they're actually paperweights. Um, my Nana was a really um, influential person in my life. She was an artist who never really had the chance to become an artist because she had a family, and it just never happened for her. And she, even as a child, I was very interested in the arts, and she would always send me professional art supplies. As an eight-year-old, 12-year-old, this is a big deal. And I felt, you know, we had this connection over all the other grandchildren. It was like, you know, we were connected. And I always felt that she, it was wonderful that she valued, you know, and kind of uh, pushed me and um, supported me in making things. And I mean, I remember getting these packages, and I would just, it was like the best day ever. So when she passed away, she was a person who collected things, borderline hoarders material. <laughs> and her most prized collection was her paperweight collection, which she had, I'm pretty sure the number was 527. Small house, lots of paperweights. And because I was the coveted favorite grandchild, I was gifted this entire collection, <laughs> which sounds amazing, but it's also a burden. I don't need 527 paperweights. And at the time, this was you know maybe seven, eight years ago. I was moving around the country. I couldn't. You know, I don't have to space for all this stuff. Um, so my way of kind of dealing with this was to photograph them and to kind of think about collection and what does collection mean and, and thinking about, pat, you know, these are patterns. It's nothing really that different from my other work. Um, but I, I liked the idea of making something very small. And I, I like paperweights because they're small worlds, right? They're these encapsulated magical places. Very small, like a snippet. So I liked the idea, the reason why I made a straight photograph of these and that the reason why they're so large is that I love the idea of making something so small have so much weight, which I think that we can all relate to that in terms of a metaphor of whether it's my cutting words piece or someone says something to you and it's meant to be offhand, but you, it affects your whole day, right? Or whether it's a collection that's been gifted to you out of love and then becomes this big burden on you. And I had to you know, box these things up and move them around the country several times. They've since been kind of dispersed around the family. Um, I've taken my favorite, uh, I think I have 20. So it significantly <laughs> decreased. Um, so th this is my last series, um, The Weight of Paper, you know, thinking about how much things weigh, whether it's emotionally or physically. And kind of, um, I loved the light in these, capturing um, these like small little worlds and, and thinking about that pattern and that pattern in people. And at the moment, I'm working on some new text stuff. I'm, I might be revisiting my cutting words, even though I said I wasn't going to. I said those were done, I'm not sure. Um, but other than that, that's all I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to, I'd love to talk about them. So thanks okay. for... Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, <laughs> 